Hello, welcome back. Uh, today's lecture is uh, going to be on Pearl Harbor. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, the United States has been preparing for war for a while now. You know, FDR has recognized that, you know, Hitler is on this rampage in Europe. Great Britain is in a very tough spot. And, you know, so he knows that he's got to start preparing America for war. Uh, he's going to pass an armaments appropriation bill that is going to help build a two ocean Navy. Uh, that's going to be important here in a minute because he recognizes that Hitler and, you know, Germany and Japan have, uh, you know, very close ties together and that if America ends up going to war, it'll probably have to be fighting in both oceans. You know, he's passed a Selective Service Act and, you know, increased the size of the military by 800,000 people. So we're starting to train a military that uh, can prepare to fight. Well, while all of this is happening, the American public still isn't quite convinced that they want to, uh, you know, leave behind isolationism. All of that is going to change with Pearl Harbor. Uh, Pearl Harbor, the the attack on our military base in Hawaii at Pearl Harbor has actually kind of been brewing for a while. Uh, there are tensions that have been rising with uh, Japan. You know, the Washington Naval Conference tried to put limits on the, the Japanese Navy, uh, which the Japanese viewed as a direct threat to their way of life. The Japanese have been industrializing just just massively uh, within, uh, you know, the last uh, several decades. As a matter of fact, they're industrializing faster than really what anybody thought was possible. And the fact that they're a tiny island, actually, they're a series of islands, uh, but the fact that they're an island, uh, they, li they, they have limited resources. And so uh, they, they know that they're going to have to expand and they're going to need their Navy to do that. And so the Washington Naval Conference has put Japan and America, you know, at odds with each other. So there's some resentment there. Then when Japan invades Manchuria, the, uh, you know, Americans uh, start to realize, well, this is not so great. Uh, China is very important to the Western powers uh, for resources and for markets to sell goods to. And so any threat to China is really an economic threat to countries like America and France. Uh, and then Japan continues to expand in Asia and they start to take over uh, some French, former French colonies. And so the French are going to be very upset by this. And America wants to do something to <clears throat> limit this Japanese aggression. And so what we do is we cut off Japan's oil supply. Uh, Japan at this point is getting most of their oil from us. Well, you know, modern navies, modern militaries are running on uh, oil and you know, the J Japan just isn't going to be able to survive economically when uh, America turns off the oil spigot. And so Americans, you know, FDR really believes that turning off the oil spigot is going to put uh, enough pressure on the Japanese that the Japanese will capitulate and will stop being so aggressive in Asia. What FDR doesn't understand is he doesn't understand Japanese culture and he doesn't understand that the Japanese uh, will view this as a, a slight to their honor. And, uh, you know, it really just can't stand. And so, you know, the Emperor Hirohito is receiving news from his advisors that the, uh, the fact that oil has been cut off to Japan, Japan has a very limited amount of time to be able to, uh, you know, uh, get their hands on some oil before there's devastating effects to their economy. And so, uh, Contrary to what 
FDR thinks is going to happen. Uh, Japan actually is going to get more aggressive because they don't want to, you know, be, uh, you know, at the whim of, of America. And so these tensions are rising. The Japanese are going to send delegates to America to try and negotiate some sort of uh, solution to this problem. And uh, in the meantime, uh, Hirohito's advisors like Tojo here are going to start to advocate for uh, a more aggressive stance. Uh, this is uh, Tojo, who's the chief of staff of the uh, Japanese army. Uh, he's the guy that convinced Hirohito to invade China in the first place. And he saw what just happened with Germany. Germany has been wildly aggressive in Europe and the Western powers uh, just essentially capitulated to Hitler. Uh, there was, you know, I mean, Neville Chamberlain's appeasement just in Courage, more aggression around the world. And so Tojo is, is convinced that if they get aggressive, that the Western powers, the former world leaders, uh, you know, the for former world powers just aren't going to have the guts to stand up to him. And so uh, he's uh, able to convince Hirohito that uh, and an attack on America is uh, feasible, and he is going to um, he's going to recruit uh, one of the uh, you know Japanese great admirals, uh, Admiral Admiral Yamamoto, to uh, come up with a plan for uh, attacking America in Hawaii. Now the idea is that Japan doesn't really want to go in some long protracted battle with uh with with America they just want to be able to uh, secure a uh, a large empire in Asia and so they tell Yamamoto, you know, Yamamoto, come up with some sort of uh, plan to uh, be able to expand and take care of America. And so Yamamoto, who has spent time in America and has traveled around America, he actually is going to advise Tojo and Hirohito against any kind of attack against America. He's seen America's industrial might. And what he knows is, is that if America decides to put its industrial might towards war, that Japan's just not going to be able to, uh, you know, stand up against it. But he is ordered to do it anyway. And as a, a good and loyal soldier, he decides that he will uh, come up with a uh, plan to attack the United States. Now, essentially what his plan is going to be is an attack on Pearl Harbor uh, in Hawaii. That is where uh, the majority of America's Pacific fleet is going to be located. And he thinks if he can take out that fleet with a surprise attack, that it'll take America, you know, years and years and years to be able to recover and build up their Pacific fleet. In the meantime, Japan can go on, it can conquer uh, the, the Philippines and, you know, Korea, Southeast Asia, all that area and uh, solidify its uh, defensive position and dig into the point that America just will never be able to, uh, you know, uh, successfully defeat them from their defensive position. And so the attack on Pearl Harbor is not a prelude to an invasion of the United States. It's just trying to get the knockout punch. Uh, and uh, while America is down, the idea is attack the rest of Asia, scoop up all the land that they need to get all the resources they need, become oil independent by, you know, taking over areas in, in the Philippines and in China. And then at that point, dig in, and then you can fight a defensive war that, you know, as a, you know, as a, essentially a, you know, an autocratic country like Japan can fight for the long haul in a democracy, maybe not so much, right? You know, uh, democratic people don't tend to want to be at war for, for a very long time. And so uh, that ends up being Yamamoto's plan. He doesn't want this conflict, but he decides that he's going to try and come up with a plan uh, that he believes uh, will give Japan the most amount of uh, success. And so 
He comes up with this plan. The logistics of this plan are, you know, uh, absolutely just crazy for uh, most people to believe. You know, tensions have been rising for a while between America and Japan. And so, you know, America is not uh, under this, um, you know, uh, America is doesn't think that Japan is non-threatening, right? Uh, we know that the uh, Americans in charge really kind of do expect that maybe Japan might attack us. And, uh, you know, and so the military leaders start to tell commanders in the Pacific to prepare. There might be some sort of attack. You know, General Douglas MacArthur is warned in the Philippines, you know, the attack is probably going to be, uh, you know, in the Philippines. And so there is this sense that Japan is potentially a threat. Nobody thinks they're going to attack right away because remember, they've got people in Washington that are negotiating with America at the time. And so, you know, it would just be, you know, uh, crazy to believe that while two countries are negotiating, one would attack another. That's just, you know, just diplomatically, you know, not supposed to happen. But we're, we're kind of preparing for that. Nobody, however, believes that the attack will be at Hawaii. Hawaii is about 4,000 miles away from Japan, and just nobody believes that you can move a fleet that far without anybody knowing. And, and people just believe that the logistics of that will be uh, too much. And that's why uh, Yamamoto comes up with that plan. He's going to attack where the Americans least suspect it. And so, uh, you know, the uh, Chinese, I'm sorry, the Japanese uh, have been expanding. We know they're very nationalistic. They have uh, taken over, uh, you know, significant portions of, of China, uh, you know, and Korea. The, when the, the Japanese uh, invade these areas, uh, they're absolutely brutally repressive. Again, it's a part of this nationalism, this idea that, you know, the Japanese people are far superior to other Asians, that these other Asians are just dogs. And so, uh, you know, uh, part of the reason why we place this oil embargo on the Japanese uh, is because of this brutal behavior. And, and this oil embargo is doing its job, right? I mean, it's, it's not 75 to 90 percent of the oil that the Japanese are using is coming from the United States and, and, and elsewhere. And, and, you know, they're completely dependent on this foreign oil and we can't just turn the spigot off and expect nothing to happen. So. On December 7th, 1941, Yamamoto will uh, pull off his plan. Uh, he is going to be able to sneak his fleet into uh, Hawaii and successfully uh, attack our, uh, our ships and our, our fleet in Hawaii. Now, uh, you know, they're using the, you know, brand new aircraft carriers and uh, the uh, you know, airplanes. Uh, Americans are, you know, essentially caught off guard. Uh, most of uh, our, our soldiers are you know, taking the day off and, uh, you know, really nobody kind of expects an attack. The weather's great. It's Hawaii. People are outside playing baseball, you know, doing uh uh, you know, just ha having a relaxing day. And then all of a sudden uh, the Japanese attack. And when the, the Japanese attack, you know, they uh, go after the airfields first. So it, it becomes very difficult to uh, defend. Uh, we're going to see uh, of the eight ships that are stationed there, uh, three battleships will get sunk. One will be uh, grounded. Four more will be damaged. Uh, you know, most of our, our airplanes are actually sitting out on the runway, which makes them sitting ducks. This should not have happened. Uh, and so, you know, it's going to be very difficult to defend these. Uh, most people think the ships that are in the harbor uh, should have been safe because the water was too shallow for torpedoes to work. Uh, but the Japanese actually came up with a really inventive way to uh, be able to use their torpedoes in shallow water. They built like wooden boxes around them to help them float uh, at the surface. Uh, and it's going to be, you know, a, a, a very successful attack. Now, uh, as luck would have it for uh, the American Americans, the aircraft carriers are actually not at port. If they would have been, uh, this, you know, the attack would have been much more devastating. And so um, what we see is, you know, the uh, 
the USS Arizona is going to be uh, hit with a torpedo. We'll see, oh, you know, a 1,000. 800 pound bomb was going to hit the ammunition hold, which is going to cause a massive explosion. Uh, it will sink with a thousand men on board. Uh, the USS Oklahoma will be hit by a torpedo as well. Uh, the Oklahoma will flip onto its side. Uh, and so, uh, you know, essentially, uh, you know, be taken out of commission there. And so this is uh, pretty devastating and is is going to be viewed as a, uh, you know, a victory for the Japanese. And, and you know, when Yamamoto hears about it, uh, he actually has a rather subdued response to it. Uh, he essentially just says, uh, you know, I fear we've woken a, this sleeping dragon. And so America you know, uh, he's afraid that um, he's just essentially pissed off America and that, uh, you know, that we'll, we'll end up uh, seeking revenge and he's, he's not wrong there. So the, uh, it looks to be a very successful attack on uh, Pearl Harbor, but it's actually not as successful as, you know, you, you would have thought, uh, you know, when you take a look at all the, the damage that is done, there's going to be very significant uh, damage. 175 planes are going to be destroyed. Again, most of them are just, uh, you know, uh, carelessly sitting out in the, the airfields, which is should not have been done. Uh, we're going to see 2,335 Americans killed. Uh, over 1,000 more are going to be injured. And it looks devastating, but it's not as bad as, uh, you know, what it seems to be because the Japanese make a mistake. They go after all the weapons, but they don't go after the repair shops and they don't go after the oil fields and the fact that there are uh, the oil reserves, I should say. And because they don't do that, they've hurt us, but they haven't destroyed us, right? Uh, because they leave the machine shops intact, uh, we're actually going to be able to repair uh, the majority of the damage that gets done. Uh, we've got the, the oil necessary and the, the fuel necessary to be able to do that as well. And like I said before, the aircraft carriers uh, aren't in the harbor. Uh, they're actually out at sea on maneuvers. And so, um, you know, we're going to, uh, you know, although this is a devastating blow against the United States, uh, it is definitely uh, survivable. And so uh, here's the quote. I actually think I said dragon earlier, but it's a giant. Uh, I fear we have awakened a sleeping giant and instilled in it a terrible result. Off. Yamamoto knows the American people. Uh, he's seen our uh, industrial might, our ingenuity, and uh, he recognizes that uh, this is, although he might have won the battle, uh, the war is a totally different, uh, different situation. And so uh, FDR uh, is uh, going to immediately uh, go to Congress and he's going to ask for a, a declaration of war, right? You know, it's a, a day that will forever live in infamy. Uh, and America will declare war against Japan. And it's at this point that Hitler will then do FDR a huge favor, right? Uh, as soon as Japan attacks America, uh, Hitler uh, just declares war on America. And so, you know, he recognizes that, you know, he's got this relationship with Japan and that there's going to be this fight. I think he sees the writing on the wall and he just steps up and declares war. Now, that's a favor to FDR because FDR knows he's going to have to go to war with Japan, but he really wants to focus on Germany first. But, uh, you know, it's politically a stretch to get attacked by Japan and then declare war on Germany, who didn't attack us. So when Hitler declares war on uh, the United States, uh, just a couple days later, it, that's going to allow FDR to declare war on Germany. And now, although we just got attacked by Japan, immediately, uh, you know, FDR knows that the focus needs to be on Germany. Germany has Great Britain uh, on the ropes, and if we're going to get involved in this war, uh, we need to uh, step in and help Great Britain before they're knocked out of the fight, which is would make the fight in Europe much more difficult. And so he essentially says, uh, you know, there'll be a small symbolic attack, Doolittle's raid uh, against the Japanese just to show them that if you hit us, we'll hit you back. Uh, but then the main focus ends up being on uh, 
the, the main focus ends up being on Germany. Now, this political cartoon here, another Dr. Seuss cartoon, uh, we see uh, a bird uh, that's labeled isolationism uh, and he's being blown up. Uh, you know, there's an explosion coming out of the word war and the caption at the top that says uh, he never knew what hit him. Uh, and so essentially what this is saying is any attempts at isolationism uh, essentially are going to be over after Pearl Harbor. It just blows up the entire concept of isolationism. Groups like America First just uh, disappear essentially overnight. Uh, there's nobody, uh, you know, well, there, I, I shouldn't say there are always people that are opposed to war. There's always going to be some people that resist, but there's the, any real significant resistance to war is essentially going to disappear overnight. Uh, you're going to start to, to see political cartoons like this one, again, Dr. Seuss, uh, that are going to, you know, uh, be very nationalistic. Uh, they're going to play up uh, racial stereotypes against the Japanese. Again, that's not uncommon in wartime propaganda. Uh, the idea is to dehumanize your enemy. And so uh, you're going to see uh, some, you know, pretty racist uh kind of propaganda pieces or things that we would uh, deem as racist uh, today. Uh, you'll see, you know, derogatory terms for Japanese being used. Um, and uh, again, all of that is in an effort to dehumanize the enemy that we're, we're going to have to uh, be uh, fighting. And so here we've got a bird with American flag hat on. We can assume he is Uncle Sam sitting in a rocking chair. It means he's like laid back, taking it easy, right? Minding his own business, being peaceful, rocking in his little rocking chair. Uh, and, uh, you know, the uh, caption at the top says the end of the nap, essentially claiming America has been sleeping. Uh, this whole time. And uh, he's woken up by a, a bunch of uh, Japanese characters who are, uh, you know, shooting him with the slingshot, hitting him in the hammer, uh, you know, stabbing him in the back with the drill, cutting the floor out from underneath him. Uh, and all that is in reference to the surprise attack. The surprise attack that is just even more vicious considering that Americans were negotiating with the Japanese when they hit us. And so we view that as very ungentlemanly and, uh, you know, uh, dastardly. And so there's this, you know, going to be this recurring theme in these propagandas that the Japanese are sneaky and deceitful and, uh, you know, uh, essentially, uh, you know, attacking poor, innocent America. When remember, we're not all that innocent. We cut off their oil supply, essentially starving their economy, you know, knowing that we that we did that. Now, we did that in response to their invading other countries. So I'm not saying that America is not justified in, in you know, uh, the oil embargo, but I'm just saying this uh, isn't as much of a surprise attack as, you know, FDR's administration really kind of plays it up to be. Now, there's no evidence to suggest that FDR knew of any credible uh, threat to Pearl Harbor. I know there's all kinds of conspiracy stuff out there, you know, uh, you know, intercepted whatever messages, uh, that's not credible evidence, right? I mean, you know, we, we did think there was going to be an attack. We did think it was going to be the Philippines, uh, and it ended up being Pearl Harbor and the Philippines because the Philippines were attacked at the same time. Uh, and, uh, you know, but nobody really expected Pearl Harbor. Nobody, uh, you know, nobody knew that was, that was coming, but we did, uh, expect some sort of attack. And so uh, we've got another uh, political cartoon right here. Uh, we've got, again, the uh, bird with the American flag hat. So this is, again, Uncle Sam uh, reading a book for rules uh, for gentlemen's conduct in combat, implying that America is uh, behaving by the rules. Uh, and then uh, we see uh, behind the corner here on the right side of the screen, we have a, a Japanese character, again, with the you know racial stereotype of slanty eyes eyes. Uh, we've got Hitler in the background, we know, because of the mustache that he made infamous, um, which really, he wasn't the first to do that. Charlie Chaplin was, but, you know, he made it uh, the most famous mustache in the world, I would imagine, uh, and the swastika. And so they're hiding behind the corner being sneaky. Uh, we see that the bird's got the swirly thing, so he's already been attacked. 
And then the caption that says, time to swap the old book for a set of brass knuckles. So it's time for America to get dirty. And so you can see uh, the bricks this, that we got hit, surprised, attacked with are Pearl Harbor and Manila. Manila's in the Philippines. And so uh, the Philippines will be another successful attack. Remember, I just said that the, the Pearl Harbor was attacked at the same time as the Philippines were. Uh, you know, Douglas MacArthur, who, you know, comes out of World War II, a hero for some reason, you know, he to return after he's run off of uh, out of the Philippines. Um, you know, I, I don't really understand why that is. He was told that there was an attack coming. He didn't prepare. Uh, he just kind of ignored it. And, you know, a, a lot of people lost their lives in America will temporarily lose the Philippines because of it. He will triumphantly return uh, and, you know, conveniently forget that, it, it you know, uh, he was forewarned and didn't prepare. So, Anyway, uh, what we've got here is the, again, this idea of a surprise attack that America was minding its business, playing by the rules, uh, not to the aggressor. Uh, and now it's time to put down the gentleman's rules for conduct and put on the brass knuckles and get to business, uh, which is uh, essentially what is going to happen. So it's now at this time uh, that we really start to see the effects of this, uh, this combination of nationalism, right? We were just attacked. And so you see a rise in patriotism to the level that it gets a little bit, I shouldn't say a little bit, significantly carried away uh, and rises to a level of nationalism, this, uh, you know, sense of superiority. And so every good American, you know, um, doesn't just rally around the flag. Uh, they start to um, uh, take it to racial extremes. And so that comes to a time period referred to as yellow peril. Uh, and so, uh, yellow peril is essentially, uh, just the fear and hatred of Asian people. Notice I don't say Japanese people. I'm saying Asian people very specifically because, uh, you know, white Americans at the time, um, are not, um, what's the, what's the word for, it? uh, are not educated enough or even care enough to make a distinction between a Japanese person, a Chinese person, who's probably our ally, a Korean person, right? It's all the same. It's those people from over there that look different from us. And so uh, there's becomes this severe distrust of uh, Asian people all across the United States. We see a photo here of a, you know, a, a white woman in uh, America with a sign on her front door says, Japs keep moving. This is a white man's neighborhood. Japanese people uh, and, and Asian people just in general are going to be massively discriminated against, uh, you know, all across uh, the United States. Uh, and again, that's when you combine this idea of nationalism, this not, not just patriotism, right? I love my country. That's patriotism. Nationalism takes it a step further and says, not only do I love my country, but my country and my people are better than all the other countries and all the other people that my people and my country are superior to those. So you combine that nationalism with the propaganda to dehumanize the Japanese because, you know, you're fighting a war and, you know, the way the military looks at it is if I'm going to get people to pull the trigger and kill the enemy, uh, it's easier for them to do that if they're dehumanized and they're not viewed as real people. And so this propaganda comes out about the Japanese being sneaky. We just looked at a bunch of it being evil and, and you know, uh, all of that. And so you combine those two things and you're going to see a rise of uh, racism and discrimination against the Japanese all across the United States. And so, I mean, you see children here uh, protesting out in the, the streets down with the Jap the rats, right? I mean, it's, it is very, very pervasive. And so um, you see uh, children's toys, uh, hunting license issued, uh, open season for that vile, stinking viper known as the Jap snake uh, will be recognized by the hissing noise that sounds like, so sorry, please, right? Which is clearly supposed to be this like racist um, 
a dig at ja uh, Japanese culture. Uh, warning, uh, do not turn your back as this uh, animal is noted for backstabbing. Again, the betrayal uh, signed by the Viper Exterminating Committee. I mean, this is like issued to kids and it's, you know, playing up all these racial stereotypes and then it's talking about killing them, right? Uh, and so, you know, the average Japanese person uh, is, you know, second generation, uh, you know, American. And so they don't like you know, they don't have any real connection to Japan anymore. Uh, and even the, the Japanese uh, that are here in the United States, uh, you know, there's no evidence that there's any sort of conspiracy for the Japanese to be, um, you know, uh, uh, spying uh, for the country of Japan or sabotaging America. There's really no evidence for that. But uh, because of this fear and hatred of Asian people, uh, we're going to see, you know, uh, American discriminating against them. Uh, the, clearly hits an all-time high after Pearl Harbor. It's been around for a while, ever since, you know, the Japanese started coming to uh, California during the gold rush and, and you know, uh, working on the Transcontinental Railroad and such. And so FDR ends up passing uh, Executive Order 9066. Uh, and Executive Order 9066 is going to set up internment camps for Japanese Americans uh, on the West Coast. Uh, FDR thinks that uh, the Japanese uh, are a potential potential spying threats, the West Coast, uh, you know, uh, there's all kinds of Japanese people living in the, the California region. And so he thinks that they're spying on the ship movements, the cargo ships, the military bases. And so the idea is to pick up all the Japanese and move them out into the desert places like Nevada, uh, and to keep an eye on them. Uh, he's going to do this without due process. He's throwing them in concentration camps. Now, these are not like Nazi concentration camps. They're not work camps. They're not death camps, although the Japanese will be doing work there. Uh, it's not these uh, forced labor camps where they're they're worked to death, uh, but they are being, uh, you know, uh, losing their due process. The Japanese are going to be told to, uh, you know, some a man with a gun is going to knock on their door and the, the government is going to say, come on, let's get on this bus, take what you can carry. And the Japanese uh, aren't going to be told when they can come back. Uh, they have no idea how long they're going to be gone. They're going to be forced to sell their houses and their businesses, uh, which means that, you know, a lot of them are going to have to sell their houses and businesses for pennies on the dollar. People are going to come in and exploit that and say, look, if you don't sell it to me right now for uh, super, super cheap, no one's going to buy it. And you're going to need money while you're out there because, you know, you don't know when you're going to come back. And and so, uh, you know, Japanese people are going to lose, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of uh, wealth. The ones that don't sell, they're going to leave their house abandoned and they're going to find that by the time they get back, there's going to be other people living in them. Uh, and a lot of them won't get their homes back. And so, uh, you know, it's a, a really terrible, terrible time for uh, the Japanese. And all of this is because uh, the American people believe that there is a secret fifth column, which means, uh, you know, the uh, the fifth column is the, uh, like unofficial military members uh, that are going to rise up across America and, uh, you know, do Japan's bidding. And so you see another Dr. Seuss cartoon here waiting for the signal from home. All these Japanese are, you know, lining up, waiting for the command from uh, you know, the uh, mother country, Japan, uh, to rise up and attack with this dynamite and sabotage Americans. And so you know, we have rounded them up into these camps. Uh, the camps, most Japanese people are going to go willingly, even though they're losing their rights. Uh, they believe it's like their patriotic duty. Uh, they're going to be surrounded by fences with men with guns. Uh, there's going to be cramped living conditions, living in these big like uh, barrack kind of style situations. Uh, and so, you know, disease is going to be uh, rampant. Uh, you know, they're, they've lost their freedom, but most of the Japanese that live there are are going to try and live as productive lives as possible. They're going to set up schools. They're going to set up their own policing. Uh, they're going to set up their own like uh, makeshift governments. They're going to grow their own food, although there will be food for, uh, provided for them. And they're going to uh, make efforts, actual to lead to make efforts to help with the war effort, right? Uh, they're going to sew uh, camouflage netting and, uh, you know, do uh, things of that nature to help the war out. And so, you know, uh, the, the uh, Americans are, uh, you know, rounding up these people that are, are 
just more patriotic and, and willing to self-sacrifice than I think I ever would be. Uh, and so it's a real kind of tragic uh, part of American history. And so you could see pictures of, of what conditions are like. And, and remember, these people, not only are they here and making this sacrifice and, and you know, completely unconstitutionally, and we'll talk about that. There's actually a couple of court cases uh, about Executive Order 9066, uh, but they're, you know, they're, they're making these uh, sacrifices and they don't know how long they're going to be there. And so that, I mean, that's got to just be, uh, you know, just a devastating thing to have to deal with. And so uh, we will see that, uh, you know, it's not just the, uh, it's not just the uh, taking away of rights that is happening. We're going to see anti-Asian uh, propaganda uh, pop up in uh, all kinds of uh, cartoons as well, targeted at children. And so, uh, you know, I will post the uh, actual PowerPoint as the link to some of these videos, uh, some of the Past videos on, on previous slides include George Takai from Star Trek talking about his time in the concentration or in the, one of the concentration camps and how awful it was. Uh, some of these videos uh, are up on YouTube, which is Bug Bunny, Bugs Bunny's uh, Tokyo Jokyo. I think that's actually been taken down off of YouTube now. Uh, and then there's Popeye's Your Sap Mr. Jap, which is again going to play up on racial stereotypes about how awful the uh, Japanese people are, how they can't be trusted. Uh, but it's essentially during, you know, the 1940s, we're going to be indoctrinating kids uh, and, and telling them uh, that the Japanese are, you know, racially inferior and, you know, evil, uh, evil people. And so, um, the executive order 9066 will be challenged in court and uh, make it all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the initially, uh, it is going to be declared, uh, the concentration camps are going to be declared constitutional. Uh, the Supreme Court will semi-reverse itself later and uh, essentially say that, hey, during times of war, the government for national security reasons can, uh, you know, suspend people's liberty without due process, uh, without full due process, uh, but there has to be substantial threat. And uh, the Supreme Court has determined that uh, FDR did not have the uh, evidence required to prove a substantial threat. And so, uh, you know, the internment of the Japanese in concentration camps, uh, you know, ultimately proves to be unconstitutional. Now, say that to, you know, what's that mean to the people that had to spend years of their lives in one of those camps? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how much it means, but, uh, you know, hopefully uh, the fact that the Supreme Court stepped in, uh, this type of thing doesn't happen again. All right. Uh, that is it for today's lecture. I appreciate it. And I will see you again soon.